You ready? I'm ready. <laughs> Is that no, no pad nope, ready? Nope. Right? Yes, yes, okay. Pad right here. Okay, superintendent's report. Alan. Yes, I'm going to try to do these as quickly as possible and just run down through them uh, just so you have some sense of them very quickly. The first one is the uh, November 19th focus on curriculum co uh, conference that we had. It was an all-day teacher workshop. This is the one which we've talked about so many times is where teachers from K through 12 met together and worked on curriculum and talked about curriculum. The a, uh, ELA group met as their first official meeting with all that they finished up. And it was a, it was a great day. Uh, each of us as administrators uh, of a SAR group, I had the guidance uh, staff and other people were working with other groups in the, in the area. But I think the most important thing for you to see is that a full day workshop is very important because it offers a lot of time where we can work and share together, both in the process of looking at curriculum but also in taking the breaks uh, and talking to them as well and talking to people. So just, that's just a quick overview of that. The second one is the December 1st report. As you remember, I revised that report from our last meeting and took out a lot of the statistics, et cetera. The statistics are still sitting on my desk because I have a feeling that some of those will be requested. But I did want you to have a copy of this. I will mention really quickly that there was an article in one of the local newspapers recently that quoted some things out of the original report. That person got the original report instead. Uh, I did talk with her and explained to her that it, the one that had all the statistics in it uh, is not the one that went out, but there were some quotes in there. Uh, and so just so you know how that happened. Uh, I think I did that backwards. Uh, the report on November 27th, school board workshop. That's the workshop we had uh, on the 27th where we talked about several issues that you had brought up that was on the yellow sheets of paper. And the specific things we talked about was technology and looking at technology and where we were going <coughs> in the future with it. The second part was Keith Weatherby was there to talk about athletics and the athletic programs and to answer some questions about that. And the third part was to talk about textbooks in the schools, uh, what we have, how old they are, what needs replacement, et cetera. There are also several other pieces, but we didn't have time to cover those, and all those other pieces will be included in the budget, included in the budget reports. So that's just, again, a very quick overview of each of those. Uh, the next piece is uh, Jack, uh, who would like to speak very briefly about the Chinese program and the program he attended at, at Colby. Am I right, Jack? Well, I hadn't planned to speak briefly. Oh, yeah, I know. It's an hour and a half, but that's right. okay. Right, right. <laughs> um, <laughs> look at that look. <laughs> Uh, when, I that we adjourn. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, there's actually a reason I, I'd like to speak because it's somewhat timely. Um, I was reminded of something when Anna Tranfeglia was speaking uh, about her time at the conference and the Venezuelan students behind her are speaking two languages. And um, some of you may know this already, but if, if you speak two languages, you're bilingual. Speak three languages, you're trilingual. If you speak only one language, you're American. Okay. Um, and and that's, that's been the way we've survived, really, uh, for most of our history. And the reason we could do that so well in recent decades has been that since World War II, uh, the United States has had such power economically, militarily, and industrially, we could basically impose our will on the world. Uh, that's changed. Uh, we could require the rest of the world to speak English, basically, for all these years, um, but the power has shifted and is shifting very fast, uh, really to East Asia. And uh, if you haven't kept up with the news on what's been happening with relationship to that, there's uh, a lot of articles about it. One, I don't want to, I don't want to posture one language against the other, but I'm just going to take this as an example. Education: the future does not speak French. Okay, uh, another article which puts it and a little bit of balance on it. Chinese is not the new French, it's the new English. Um, and in fact, Chinese has become uh, the fastest growing language throughout the world. Uh, I think it's the language that more people speak in the world than any other language. Unfortunately, uh, the English-speaking population of the world is the only large population that speaks only one language. Um, the future really belongs to China, at least as far as the 21st century goes. 
The United States government recognizes this. Uh, the United States government has already identified uh, Mandarin and Farsi as the two most important languages for the United States in this century, and they're putting a lot, starting to put a lot of money into education of those languages. We think of ourselves as one of the best school systems in the country, but there are already 550 schools in the country teaching Mandarin. In, Ch in Maine, there are 10 schools teaching Mandarin. Um, some of them have just begun, but there are 10. And we haven't really begun to consider it until now. There was a conference at Colby College, an all-day conference on November 30th that I attended. Uh, the title was Teaching Chinese in Maine. And the conference was uh, organized by a group of nonprofit organizations that help school systems around the country get started teaching Chinese. It was co-sponsored by the Department of Education of the state of Maine. Uh, a fellow named Don Reutershan from the Department of Education was there and strongly encouraging the attendees to work hard to get Chinese established in their school systems. And in fact, there were about 60 school systems from Maine at that conference. Um, a very strong representation from southern Maine here, from, from Falmouth, both the superintendent and assistant superintendent were there. Yarmouth had three people there. Scarborough was there, Gorham, Westbrook, <coughs> you name it. I mean, all the, all the good school systems were there. Um, the thing I really want to focus on to try to keep this short is there is a program that is a very attractive program that has somewhat of a short fuse that I think it's worth us seriously considering. The program is run by the College Board in conjunction with Hanban, which is the Chinese uh, government uh, institute to help promote Chinese language around the world. The state of Maine has made itself a partner in this program. And not only did they sponsor the conference, but they have memorandum of understanding with the College Board in Hanban uh, to try to encourage Maine school systems to apply to the College Board in Hanban for the guest teacher program. Hanban, <clears throat> beginning at the beginning of this year, beginning in 2007, started bringing teachers into this country from China, guest teachers, for two to three year stays in different places throughout the country. In January, they brought 35 teachers in. In September, they brought 64 more teachers. And there's now a new cycle that the applications are due in January for teachers to come in in the beginning of the 2008-2009 school year. I believe from talking at length with the people up at Colby, um, Selena, uh, what's the last name? I forget Selena from uh, the College Board. I spent a long time talking with her. I spent a long time talking with Don Reutershan. Um, I spent a long time talking with school systems who are already working this problem in Maine, as well as school systems that are applying for it. Um, I believe because of our, the nature of who we are in Cape Elizabeth, the nature of our school system, uh, that we would have an excellent shot of getting a guest teacher. Although it's a competitive process, I believe we're positioned well to do that. Um, the regular timeline for the application was, was due to be January 11th, but because of some of the feedback from Maine, they're re revising the application a little bit, so the application deadline will move to the end of January rather than the early part of January. It gives us a little more time. Um, it's a very simple application, five simple pages. Uh, the Chinese <coughs> government pays a stipend. Uh, they, they pay all travel expenses, they pay the stipend. Uh, the guest community has the responsibility for housing and transportation, and that's it. And the program provides for a teacher uh, for two years, with a third year at the option of both the teacher and the school system. Um, now, I've sent you an email around, and I got an interesting set of questions back from Tricia, which made me dig a little further into things. Most of the school systems using the guest teachers are doing it in middle school and high schools. There are a few doing it in elementary schools. And in fact, I made a call to the college board today to get more information. <coughs> and uh, Selena was traveling, so I haven't heard back from her. Uh, but I will follow up on that. Um, I know when I talked with Jeff back again weeks ago, uh, he's interested in the Chinese language getting involved in the schools too. But he, he and I shared a long-term, at least, uh, interest in the best way to do that is to do it at the lowest levels. Um, so maybe we can use this program for that, maybe not. I don't know the answer to that yet. Um, 
that it, it is another important question that goes along with teaching China in any school system in Maine. You bring a guest teacher in from China, and the guest teacher's here for two to three years, what do you do after that? Well, the number of certified teachers uh, of Chinese in Maine right now is a relatively small number, like two, maybe three. Um, I don't want to go into this in any great detail. Uh, it, we may have an opportunity to pick one up. If, um, so there's a number of things happening. I just found that out serendipitously after the conference. It wasn't part of the conference proceedings. So anyway, um, I, would, I would like to think that we look at this carefully over the next month, something like that, and see if we can make a decision to go forward with it. I think it's something that's uh, very worthwhile. It's being recognized as uh, a very valuable addition to school systems. It's not a big resource commitment to start with on our part, so you treat it as a two-year experiment, if you would, at very low cost. Great. Thank you, Jack. Questions? Uh, can we, in terms of investigating it, can we ask the, either the administrators or the World Language Department to kind of see if this is something? Uh, just from, I remember when May was here, you need someone to shepherd to sort of right. program to arrange it. And I would think that the world language would be the place yeah. to start. You're going to have to have some sort of mentor relationship. So if that's something, could we request that that discussion Jeff, be had among all the principals? My understanding, Jeff, is the head of the foreign language department at the high school was at the conference as well and has had some conversations with you. So I think, I think it would be, be wise for her and Jack to meet and talk about Yeah, it. Had, we could share notes because I'm sure we talked to different people there too. But also to address, uh, Susan Dana actually made an interesting comment yeah. that Mandarin and Chinese being the most difficult, the most success is at kindergarten, start at the lower level. So <laughs> while I appreciate the fact that she was there, yeah. I personally would not want to just have the high school. If we have a guest teacher, I'd like the discussion to be bigger than just the foreign language department chair at the high school and Jack. It would be great if we could involve the entire world language department all the way through to let me, the Let me school. just supplement that with some comments. I, I spoke with <clears throat> the gentleman who established the Chinese program in Westbrook 10 years ago. And that program is basically a two-year program in the high school for, for uh, Chinese language teaching Mandarin. Um, and the reason that program has survived for 10 years in Westbrook was they found that even with only two years of instruction, the students who graduated, a number of them, put that, to, that language to use right away professionally in their careers. And so it was a very important strength for them. And so Westbrook said, yeah, let's keep it going for that reason. So it's, it's not, doing it for two years in high school is not, a, uh, is not a waste. A lot of schools are doing that right now. That's a good preparation. Long term, I believe that starting it as early as possible is, is the best solution. I would just hate to be in the situation that we seem to be in with Latin. And we heard that last year in terms of you start a program, but it's difficult yeah. to build it every year where it's concerned about funding. So I would just like yeah. to address that aspect well, of it. Let me uh, supplement what I said. I just mentioned the College Board. There's a, there's a federal government program called FLAP, Foreign Language Assistance Program. And they have two districts for it. One is aid to schools, individual schools, and one is, is to larger uh, districts, school districts that go beyond one town. Um, and they actually provide a lot of funding for training of, of teachers as well as hiring of teachers uh, to keep programs going in a strong way. And again, their emphasis is Mandarin and Farsi. Those are the two most important languages. I just would add one more piece to it. If you all remember, we have an ATM center at the high school, which is not being used now as an ATM center. But it is a possibility to play a role in that program, too, as we begin to develop something like that, if we can get the money uh, to move forward with it. So to where do we go from here, Ellen? I, I, I think probably, uh, I, I think we need to have probably a conversation with the foreign language department there. They are probably an extremely creative group of people. And so I think we need to set up some time with them. And I think it would be really important for both Jack and the head of the department to talk with all of them about what they saw and begin right. to talk about yep. what are the possibilities. And I'm yep. looking to Jeff because I know Jeff and I have had that conversation. And I think that would be a, a good starting point for that as soon as possible. 
Yeah, I have a fair amount of availability after this week, Jeff. So. Well, thank you very much, Jack. I want to take, take 20 seconds more. These were not the only organizations up at COVID. There were a number of other organizations. AFS was there, uh, the Asia Society. There's a lot of organizations that provide support for these programs. So um, I've only given you a little bit of the, the, the major ones because it's a short fuse associated with this one particular one. Okay. Thank you. Um, Karen, are you speaking about the MSBA resolution? Yes, I was just going to say something very briefly because when I read through it, um, there were a few things that I felt might be important for us or we might want to discuss as a school board. I don't know when we would do this or if we do it in our retreat, but um, certainly the MSBA's encouragement of local boards um, to assess the training and education needs of their board members and to recommend participation in appropriate regional, state, and national programs. We don't do a whole lot of that, and I think that might be very worthwhile for us to develop us as board members. Um, the MSBA support for a citizen-initiated petition to repeal mandated school consolidation <coughs> is enacted in public law 2007 if amendments addressing the serious deficiencies of the law do not occur. I thought it was interesting <coughs> that that was their stance. Um, the MSBA believed that the essential programs and services, ESP, should be subject to an objective and independent review by qualified researchers. I thought it was good to once again sort of go outside of what's being mandated based on EPS things and really think about, you know, why are we holding ourselves to those EPS numbers? And finally, the MSBA opposition to tax caps I found very interesting, um, which they referred to as any attempt to place a limit on the responsibilities of legislative bodies, state and local, to determine the amount of tax monies to be raised to meet the legitimate needs of those who are served by government services. And I thought that was very well articulated, in my opinion. So um, I thought that might be worth our discussing at some point in time, and certainly a lot of those will come up in the context of our budget discussions. Thank you. Um, unfinished business. Trish, consideration of policies for second reading. Um, yeah, the first policy is JEA, which is compulsory school attendance. At the first reading, we had a comment that we um, wanted clarification on who would approve a planned absence? The committee discussed this, and we are not recommending a change due to the fact that the policy is pre presented is almost verbatim dictated by law. So I would move that we approve the policy JEA, compulsory school attendance, as presented. Is there a second? Second. Linda? Mm -hmm. Discussion? Uh, Rebecca? Yeah. Um, if we're going to make people get approval, are we going to have a mention in our handbooks, perhaps, how that's going to be? I believe that it is. It is in the handbooks already? Uh, well, yes, it is. Yes, it is. Thank you, Jeff. Well, so <laughs> it's one of those gray areas. If we want people to follow our policies, we need to have them implementable. So what I'm asking, not the policy committee, but Alan and the administrators, is if we're going to say they need to be approved, we have to have a mention in some resource to parents how that approval is given. I believe that is mentioned in the student handbooks. There is a policy, and it comes from, I know, for example, at the middle school it comes, when your child is absent, please contact. The high school does the same thing. All of the schools are indi indicating that when your child is absent, you need to contact the office. So sort of by default, and there is an attendance monitor at the offices, and if, that, if, there's, if there are absent patterns that are developing, then the school follows up on those patterns. So there's sort of, it, it's, it is sort of a tacit approval. Okay. I guess I'm still um, <clears throat> not comfortable with the fact that it says a planned absence for a personal educational purpose which has been approved. And I, I hear what you're saying, but my question still is, when, and it was before, approved by whom? And I, I think it comes back down to a control piece um, and who's in control of that piece and how do we implement it? Um, so I guess I'm still not comfortable with that, and I might maybe I'm missing something, which I'm perfectly happy to have somebody inform me as to what it is I'm missing, um, because that was to me that was a, a sticking point. 
a planned absence for a personal educational purpose. Well, I would assume it's the parent who is determining that it's a planned absence for a personal educational purpose. And how does that parent communicate that with the school? Is there a form? Um, does the school then feel that they have to approve it? I'm just, I'm just asking questions because I'm confused and I'm not sure I really want to approve this. He's shaking his head. Oh, I'm sorry, Jeff. I was looking this way instead of that way. Sure, and, and I understand what you're saying, I, but I still don't understand who is approving it. Is it the parent? I, I approve it at the high school. The high school's approving it. You have to get it signed by your teachers and Mr. Shad. You have to go through a lot of red tape. Okay, but that's one building. How are we at the middle school and how are we at Ponco? What happens at Ponco? Yeah. It's, um, I think what, what Jack was talking about is a little different because you're missing courses. Uh, we get uh, the classroom teacher is usually notified, and if it's going to be you know just a day or two to, to go somewhere, then it's I don't get involved. But if somebody is going to be out for a week or so, then I do get involved and, and ask why it has to be that week and why so many days off. We don't have an official form to do it though, mm -hmm. and I can't stop people. Right, if, which, if is, I don't approve, which is the point of my yeah. concern. Yeah. is by using the word approving, it's implying that a school can say yay or nay to whether a student uh, is absent for which something the parent has determined is okay. Right. It's and giving the school power over parents. Well, to some extent, they have that. This is the law. Wait till you get to the truancy policy, which we haven't presented yet. It's all the law. Great. So let's make sure that we have procedures in place that will support the law. We do, but this is the policy, not the procedure. The procedures are in the handbooks. Whether they're being implemented is different, but this is the policy, and the procedure is in the handbooks. Okay, I may be blind. I went through the handbook that I got a couple of years ago. I couldn't find it. The handbooks have been updated. We're, we're updating, but it, there's nothing in there about that because we, right. if, if somebody's made plans to, to go on vacation on school days and they're going, I can discourage it, but I, I can't make them stay. I, That's right. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. I can't make them stay home. That's right. It's tacit approval. If you don't want this in, uh, no, I guess I'm, just, I, I'm getting different messages. You're saying it's law, the school can say yay or nay. Yeah. And, and at the same time, we're hearing from an administrator saying, I can't stop them. For absence and attendance purposes, we, the law defines excusable versus, or actually inexcusable, I guess. <clears throat> we need to have this language in a policy. I guess I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in again and say I probably won't support this tonight <laughs> because I just don't think that it says, I still think that it's, as, as Rebecca's saying, I still, still think it's open. And even if the law says that, I don't think a public school can tell a parent they can't take a child out if the child is meeting the requirements of the school, whether that is the required day's attendance. They can. The difference is excusable versus right. inexcusable. Right. I think the school can say that. You can still take your child. They're not going to come to your home and say you have to bring the child to school, which they technically, I guess, do have, could possibly do. But for your child's attendance record, it would be excusable right. versus not excusable. Right. So they don't have that control over you to an extent. But for attendance record purposes, if they declined it and you still took your child out, it would not be considered an excusable absence. And the difference is? A doctor's excuse, mainly. No, no, no. I mean, the difference is between an excusable and an inexcusable absence. What does that mean? It's an unexcused absence, and it's part of one piece of a big puzzle that shows parental neglect, and that's how it gets used. 
Well, I mean, Jeff can speak to it. There'd be consequences. We, if, if you're missing the science lab, it's an unexcused absence. You'll you'll pay the price. Yeah, I can hear my head. Although again, I mean, I... <laughs> <laughs> we're just walking around the table. <laughs> and again, I, I can only speak at that. Yeah, high, yeah. The high school, my experience at high schools is, and I think it really is more of an, ex, an issue at high schools, and probably to, to a lesser extent at middle schools, because there are multiple teachers. It's the way the law is enforced, and but technically it is absolutely true that it is, Ill, it is if a parent takes a student away for vacation without getting the approval of the school under the law, it's an unexcused absence. For legal purposes, it's an unexcused absence. What do we do as a, now the law doesn't define what the consequences are for lack of, and sort of implicitly that's left up to the individual school to decide. Um, what we do is we say it's like a class cut and therefore you can't make up your work um, or we don't give detentions and quite frankly unless it's a really long thing and you know you know we don't it's it, it is more a matter of record keeping and informational thing than anything else um, but vacations are, are very often academic killers for kids they're just absolutely academic killers for kids and I know you're not questioning that Kathy but no, no. in term, but but legally a, 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 a school does have the say so about in terms of for purposes of legal absences and for purposes of truancy a parent is required to send a student to school and if they don't without excuse then technically they could they could face legally right truancy violation yeah as no well. question I mean technically now, and again, this is technically, because I've never, in all the schools I've been in, I've never seen this situation, but technically, if a parent takes a student away from school for five days without getting approval, those are unexcused absences, technically that student is truant, and technically that parent could be brought before the school board, actually, because you are the body that determines truancy or not, to determine whether the parent is doing his or her job. And that's the way, that's the state of the law. Yeah. Um, Trish, I have no issue with this language. My only concern is that we are consistent in how it's implemented in the buildings so that there's no confusion. Because, because of the technical, the technical consequences, we don't know how this may play out in one way or another. I, want to, I would like to make sure that we are being consistent in the information we're giving parents. So they can't say, I didn't know it, it wasn't there, et cetera, et cetera. So even though it's potentially really not an issue at, at the elementary school, it still is a, the school building, and it's still the law. So we do need to make sure, clearly, parents know what is expected of them. But I think our piece is the policy, and the making sure comes under Alan's jurisdiction and his staff. So. Um, I hear what you're saying. Yeah, I, so this wasn't really directed yeah. at the, the policy right. committee, but I just said it, it's, if we're yeah. not going to say in the policy who approves it, I just want to make sure it's said somewhere so parents can know what is expected of them and where, by, by when and with whom and et cetera, et cetera. Anybody else? No? All in favor? Opposed? 5-1. Um, student conduct on the buses, JICC. There were no comments at the first reading. If you recall, this was changed to accommodate verbiage on um, making bus, regular bus stops safer so that children do not have to cross the major artery, art, arteries. Um, there's an administrative guideline attached to that. There were also some language changes there. <coughs> Um, but we don't technically have to vote on the administrative guidelines, so I am moving that we approve policy, or the amended version of policy JICC as presented. Second. Thank you. Discussion? Questions? All in favor? 6 0. Um, I think that's it, right? Yep. Alan? Yes, uh, this is a consideration of superintendent's recommendations to athletic fee positions. I have one letter that is from Keith Weatherby. Uh, returning winter coaching recommendations is Art Jones, who's assistant indoor track at 48 hours at a level three. Paul Snyder, assistant indoor track, 108 hours at level three. And also a new winter coaching recommendation of Curtis Brown, 
assistant boys ice hockey at 140.4 hours at a level three. And it does note that Curtis is a graduate of Cape Elizabeth High School, Union College BA, and University of Maine at Orono MS. He played hockey at Cape Elizabeth High School and has coached summer leagues at the Portland Ice Arena. Kurt will be a great asset to the Cape Elizabeth High School hockey program. I move that we accept the superintendent's recommendation for the winter coaching positions. Thank you, Rebecca. Is there a second? Second. Trish, discussion? On the uh, assistant coach, boys ice hockey coach, is that going to be part of our budget or is that, uh, is the boosters covering the assistant coaching positions? Do you happen to know? I don't. Okay. I don't. So that's a piece we need to get included in these, and it, it wasn't this okay. Thank you. So do we know if it's a new new position, or if is it just a... It's not a new This is it's returning a, winter coaching recommendation. No, this is no, new it's under winter. new. Oh, yeah, new winter. What are you doing, the assistant boys ice hockey? Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. The new winter coaching recommendation. But that just means a, it's a new coach, not a new coach. Position. Coach. Not a position. We always ask the same question. Thank okay. you. <laughs> that helps me a lot. Thank you. Okay, anything else? All in favor? 6 0. Uh, policies for first reading. Trish. Um, ILA, which is the assessment system, I have to thank the principals for spending some time doing this. We had put this policy on hold because of the status of the assessment system. The policy you, you see in front of you has been proposed based on their review of some updated policies from some of our neighboring districts. Is this um, a new policy? It's a policy that we had that was quite old. Okay. Um, it was this, this draft is a new policy. Right. Um, we have an assessment system policy, mm -hmm. but it's very brief and very old. And do we? We need to have one. Okay. It's one of the required policies, but we didn't do any work on it because of the, you know, that whole LAS yeah. for the state. Thank you. So we kind of put it on hold. Um, truancy. This will be an interesting discussion as well. Um, <laughs> This is all law. This is all new, and the state is taking a much stronger hand. So I suppose, based on our conversation before, this is probably an administrative issue that needs to be discussed on enforcement. Um, so this is the Drummond and Woodson? This is, actually, this is Drummond, Woodson, and MSMA. It's the samples from both. It's almost all of the underlined items are, is all new legislation. Um, JICFA, student ha hazing. This actually um, was reviewed by Drummond and Woodson three or four years ago when they did their initial review of our policy binder and we just never got around to deleting it. The reason why they're recommending its deletion is because student hazing is covered now in some of our other student conduct policies. Is it um, the next one? One of them, one of the, including the next one, JICIA, which is weapons, violence, bullying, and school safety. This is an, ex there were some new laws around bullying and new requirements for policies. We had two options. We could adopt a brand new bullying policy or, as Drummond and Woodson recommended, putting the bullying language into our existing student conduct policies. This is just one of them. So this policy is our existing policy adjusted <clears throat> for new requirements around bullying. And this is the Drummond and Woodson recommendation. So those are all presented for your consideration for first reading. Any questions for Trish right now? No? Okay. Consideration of proposed revision to job description, accounts payable supervisor to accounting position. Is this Linda? Yeah. Uh, the personnel committee in November met and reviewed a amended job description which Pauline provided to us for one of the positions in her office. Um, copy of the job description is in your packet. All the changes are in red as you see. We recommend, um, I'd like to make a motion that we accept the new job description as presented. Thank you. Second. Thank you, Rebecca. Is there any discussion? No? I, yes. Oh, I two discussions. Question. Can we think of another name besides accounting position? It's kind of awkward. <laughs> the point is, I, hi, I'm your accounting position. You have a very hard time. What's wrong with the your accounting? No, what's wrong with accounting? Clerk? Because they're not going to. Oh, they're not going to. Okay. 
she's not an accountant. She's not an accountant. No. Oh. Accounting office position? Office staff. Okay. Staff. Accounting clerk. No, clerk. she's more than a clerk. Accounting personnel. More than a clerk. Okay, we like it. <laughs> See what the problem is? <laughs> is there a requirement for being called an accountant? Yeah, 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 you have to be a CPA. No, you don't have to be a CPA. No, you're a certified public accountant. Oh, I see. Yeah, but you don't have to be a CPA to be an accountant. No, no, so is, is there a requirement for an accountant? Is the problem being an accountant? I think you can I don't call see why you can't call anyone an accountant. Right, that's true. Uh, but Doesn't that's a well understood distinction she's between doing CPA accounting. And accounting. She's an accountant. Yep. If you're a farmer, you farm. <laughs> Whether you have a degree in agriculture or a yeah. degree in philosophy. She's not a certified accountant. She's just an accountant. Right. If you're a painter, you paint, right? So accountant. It's getting big. <laughs> it's called an accountant. Uh, you, are you okay account? with that? I move. <laughs> okay. I just think it's better. Does anybody have a problem with the change in the name? Um, so the motion. I just had one quick question. Is this this position does not require a bachelor's degree? Is that is that a change or the requirements of the position only require an associate's degree? I just want was curious to know. I think it says right in the job. Right, it does. But are the, is the job never required an associate's degree? Do we not feel they need a bachelor's degree? It depends on experience. I mean, we, we wanted someone with at least an associate's with experience. So that sets a minimum. So minimum. Just, right, minimum. Other, other discussion? No? All in favor? Six zero. Okay. Where am I? Was the change in name included in the motion? No, I don't think it was. I'd like to amend the motion that we approve the uh, job that description re for the accountant rather Check. than uh, rather you, than uh, accounting position. Could I be a stickler and say that the minimum? is an associate's degree? Because you don't specify that. Would you turn away someone with a bachelor's degree? No, but in minimum. Get better, normal, more qualified almost, staff person? Almost all, of, almost all of the job descriptions that we have done always give a minimum requirement. Most of them say high school diploma, and that's how it starts. Unless it's a teaching, you know, depending on what the position is. Okay. I think it goes without saying. Okay. If you show up with a bachelor's or a master's mm -hmm. and they want you, they'll take their neck and say, no, sorry, you don't have a bad art associates. <clears throat> okay. All in favor. All in favor. <laughs> Thank you, Mary, for keeping us straight on that. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Consideration for a proposal from high school teacher for field trip to Palmer, Mass. Ellen? Uh, Jeff. Jeff? Sorry. This is a proposal for Evan Thayer, who's the robotics coach, to go to Palmer, Mass. The reason it needs school board approval is because it's beyond 125 miles. This is not an overnight trip. It will involve 10 students to travel to the Massachusetts Regional Robotics Competition. Um, and, and last year, the students went to the Maine Regional Robotics Competition, and there were only four robots entered in the entire state of Maine. So they were looking for a little bit more of a sort of a sense of uh, what other people are doing out there in Massachusetts is, is, has more experience with it. Um, it the, there will be two chaperones, Evan Thayer and Eric Jensen, 10 kids. They'll be home around 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock at night, but it does not involve an overnight. It, it's, is there a motion? I move that we approve the um, field trip for the Cape Robotics team. Thank you, Rebecca. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any discussion? Pick one, Mary. I wrote Jack down because he's closer to me. Okay. <laughs> um, are, so we have more than four robots now. By the time they get to us, shouldn't they be signed by everybody? So if we have it on. We have the signed copy. I see. Thank you, Alan. 
now you can stop. Excellent. Okay. Not yet. Any dis further discussion? All in favor? 6-0. Thank you. Um, consideration of certification of employment and salary of superintendent for 2008 to 2009. Uh, okay. I should make that motion. Somebody want to make that motion? No, you do it. Me? Okay. Um, I move that we um, certify the superintendent for employment for 2008 and 2009 with a salary as determined in executive session prior to this meeting. Second. Second. Any discussions? Okay. <laughs> All in favor? Thank you. Um, nomination of school board member to Towns Energy Committee Advisory. I think we did that actually when we did the beginning. Yeah, we did. Yeah. It was on the slate. Yep. We're done. Yes, thank you. Consideration of high school girls volleyball team requests school sanctioning as club sport. I move that we, the school board sanction high school girls volleyball team. Thank you, Rebecca. Is there a second? second. Trish, discussion? Further discussion? I'd just like to specify the thing that our sanctioning is at a club level one approval. Towns Energy at this, at this time. And I th it's important, I think, for you to note that the extracurricular committee also made this recommendation. Exactly. That oh. helped. That was, thank you for that information, too. That is it. It's the same thing. It it's the yes. same thing. Is it, is it the same thing? Yep. 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 Okay, so we have a motion and a second. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, we were having a side conversation. Um, it, no further discussion? All in favor? 6 0. Okay. Um, Alan, long term sub in foreign language? Yes. Uh, as you remember, we have a sub who is leaving us the first week in January. Uh, because of her husband's change in uh, work. Uh, a new person has been uh, interviewed. Her name is Marsha Pauls Chase, who you may have heard Gail Schmader mention the other day, who does free uh, volunteering. <laughs> now we're, gonna we're, we're not going to ask her to do free uh, foreign language. So what I'm handing you is her resume. Uh, Marsha has been in the system working as a volunteer and also doing something for quite a while. She's a very, very, very talented language teacher, and so is a great addition to the system as we lose a, an excellent person as well. Uh, references have been checked, background has been checked, uh, criminal record has been checked, etc. And so I'm recommending Masha Paul's Chase as the um, long-term substitute in foreign language for the remainder of the school year. Thank you. I move that we approve the superintendent's recommendation for the hiring of a long-term um, foreign language teacher. Thanks, Trish. Second? Second. Thank you, Rebecca. Discussion? Questions? All in favor? 6-0. Okay. Um, I'd like to say, um, do the committee reports and say that if anybody feels that their committee needs to say something important this evening, then um, we'll go ahead and listen to you. Otherwise, I know that the committee report notes are on the website, and the meetings are on the website as well. So maybe um, you could just raise your hand if you want to say something that's important to your committee. Rebecca? Yeah, go ahead. OK, I thought you were going to get a sense of anybody else. Um, yeah, I would like to report on the Finance Committee that was held on um, oh, shoot, November 28th. <coughs> um, in particular, uh, Alan raised um, some concerns about uh, our actual cost this year. One is related to energy. Um, Pauline performed a, a rough forecast of what we would be looking at in terms of oil costs. And um, based on her analysis, currently she's projecting that would be roughly $100,000 over budget. Um, <clears throat> Pauline did. Uh, look also at electric usage, but she thinks that we're in pretty good shape in that area, but she is going to work on gasoline costs for our next meeting. In addition, we may have some issues around um, some personnel costs. There is a student that um, may possibly be qualifying for a one-on-one -on -one instruction from, a, from an Ed Tech 3. This was unexpected and not budgeted. The district does not have the ability to shift instructional support staff to meet this need, as there are five new instructional support students that entered the system this year and have stretched the program to its fullest. 
Allen plans to use money that is set, was set aside for the possible out-of-district placements, recognizing that should the need for such a placement occur, the district will have to find the necessary funds. As a point of information, Allen shared that there are 10 students who are in the highest level of least restrictive environment currently in our schools. In addition, looking forward, the district may be facing 11 potential retirements this year. By February, there should be a stronger indication of what that actual number will be. If 11 retirements were to occur, the district would be faced with a one-time cost of roughly $175,000 in stipends. In the past, savings from salary differentials between new hires and retirements has helped fund these types of stipends. Last year, that savings was roughly about $70,000, so we still have a potential exposure of $105,000 if we were to get the full 11 retirements. That's it. And the good news? <laughs> no. We're saving money, still saving money on electricity. Thank you, Rebecca. Is there anybody else that... Oil prices dropped this week. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, so the, Kathy, the committees, are they advisory as well? Yeah, I would... It, yeah, I mean, if you have something you feels important, then I just... Well, I do because... Oh, we'll go ahead. Yeah. Trish. I just want to remind people that there's a calendar survey on the town website. Um, and if you haven't had an opportunity to fill that out, if you could, please. And the um, reason for doing that is sort of to make our school year look, help us meet all the needs that, you know, we, we hear about constantly. And we would like that feedback and input as we're preparing the calendar for going forward. Um, some of the questions are based on the length of the year because, interestingly enough, the state of Maine has one of the shortest required school years. And in doing some comparison to other communities, Cape Elizabeth actually has the some of the, the least number of student days. There are districts, some of the comparable districts we like to compare ourselves to have a greater number of student instructional days. So those, that's the um, background to those questions. So if you haven't filled that out, if you could please do that, and it can be reached on the homepage of the school website. Thank you. Thanks. Karen? I, I do want to, um, I think the board would like to officially thank the CEF board and mini grants committee. I was going to read everything that they approved, but I'm not going to do that because that access, I'm sure, will go out in their newsletter. But their hard work and financial support help facilitate innovative educational initiatives that fall outside of our school budget. And thanks for partnering with us to help the Cape School District achieve our, our shared vision of educational excellence. Um, <coughs> and I was going to speak on Sports Done Right, but I will do that at the next because that doesn't go on the website. Okay. So, should I say it now really quickly? Sure. Get it on the record. Go on the and website. Sue Weatherby is here and she's hanging here the whole time. The Sports Done Right Leadership Team just held our second meeting on November 26. We appointed a new chair, Ken Pierce, and broke into subgroups to complete a self-assessment of sports in Cape Elizabeth. Each subgroup reported back to the whole group. We began to answer the questions of what we are doing well, where we need to improve, and what we would like to see change as a result of embracing sports done right in our community. So it was an extremely productive meeting. Uh, at our next meeting, we will complete answering these questions and we'll begin forming action committees to start the work of accomplishing the goals we have identified. Um, this next meeting will be taking place on January 9th at 7 p.m. in the high school library. Thank you, Karen. Trish? Just one more, I promise. Um, the communications committee, I would like to encourage all of you guys to attend the breakfast with the senior citizens that we're partnering over community <coughs> services, I think, is doing most of the work. On January 17th at 8.30 in the Community Services Center, we are working um, with school staff members to have some students in our student work on display there, um, pending student class schedules, and I found out it's right before midterms or tests at the high school. So. We're trying to work around that. The student portion of it should run approximately from 9.15 to 10, depending on what and what students are available. Hopefully, um, we'll have some of them there. So thanks for community services to help us to partner with them, and I would encourage all you guys to be there. Thank you. Anyone else? No? Um, public comment on agenda items. Doesn't look like it. School board agenda requests. Um, announcement of upcoming meetings. These are all on the web, are they not? Yes, they are. Okay. Um, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Thank you. Is there, thank you. Any discussion? All in favor. Thank you. I'll just pick someone to say